Hello, my name is Emmanuel Alile. I am a graduate student of California State University, Sacramento. I'm going to be giving a presentation on AAA 236 on mem transistor brings a word closer to brain like computing. Hello everyone, my name is Emmanuel. I'm a graduate student of Electrical and Electronics Engineering at California State University. Today I shall be talking about an emerging technology. MEM transistor brings world closer to brain-like computing. So here is an outline of what we'll be discussing today. The first thing we'll be talking about will be the introduction. Next, we shall be looking at the differences between the neuron and the transistor. Next, we shall be looking at the structure of a MEM transistor, which includes MEM resistors and a material used to manufacture MEM transistors known as molybdenum disulfide. The next, we shall be looking at the fabrication of the MEM transistor. We shall also be talking about the achievements or the advantages of the MEM transistor. And as we all know, a device cannot be 100% perfect. So therefore, we shall be talking about the limitations of the main transistor. Then we'll talk about conclusion and summarize everything we have discussed. Then the references will be the last. Computer systems over the years have made advancements in the area of performing brain-like functions. Back in the 20th century, no one would believe that it was possible for the computers to recognize the face of an individual of an individual. But computers perform more than that. Modern computers have the ability to even recognize speech and learn the language of humans. One thing we notice about this is that computers of nowadays can perform some functions that the brain can perform. However, computers still lack the ability to fully mimic or imitate the human brain. Why do we say so? The brain has numerous advantages or edges over computer. We shall be discussing three of those advantages. The first advantage is that the computer has higher processing power. I beg your pardon, the brain has higher processing power. The brain has the ability to multitask. The brain can measure our blood pressure, measure our heartbeat, and also at the same time we get to decide and think with our brain. Scientists came to find out that it took 82,944 supercomputer to perform the function that the brain perform in just one second. So that comes to make us understand that the brain truly has higher processing power. And on top of that, the brain consumes very low power. When engineers came to measure the amount of power that the brain consumes, they came to find out that the brain consumes just about 20 watts. That is the energy that a dim light bulb consumes. So upon all the functions that the brain performs, the brain is an excellent manager of power. And even at this, the brain is relatively smaller in size. What do we mean by this? To put things into perspective, we notice how many computers it takes to perform the function that a human brain can take. So we notice that it takes a full room of computers to perform what a human brain can perform. So I'll be concluding my introduction by quoting what E. O. Wilson said. He said, overall, the human brain is the most complex object known in the universe. That is to say, if humans are able to develop devices that can mimic or imitate the human brain, there will be tremendous advancements in our modern technologic society. For us to be fully be able to mimic the human brain, we have to know the difference between a neuron and a transistor. Because the neuron is the fundamental unit of the human brain, just like how the transistor is the fundamental unit of basic electronic of electronic devices. This section talks about the differences between a neuron and a transistor. At the image at the left hand side of this slide, we come to see a simple MOSFET transistor. One thing we we'll notice about this transistor is that it only has a maximum number of three connections. That is to say, 
the input voltage, the output voltage, and also the power supply. One thing we also notice is that only one signal can be switched or amplified at a time, and that is the input voltage. Due to this, those devices cannot simultaneously perform processing and storage. That is why in our modern computer devices, a separate unit performs storage function while another um, unit, which is known as the CPU, perform processing functions. Now, how does this measure up to neurons? For neurons, the number of connections is not three as it is in the transistor. A neuron can make up to 10,000 different connections. On the image shown in this slide, we notice uh, what, how many connections a single neuron can make to other neurons. Due to the fact that a neuron can make up to 10,000 different connections, we come to find out that multiple signals can be processed by a single neuron at an instant. Unlike the transistor, where only one signal can be amplified or switched. Therefore, a neuron can simultaneously perform processing and storage function. Processing function usually occur at the heart of the neuron, while storage function usually occur at the junction between a neuron and another neuron. So these differences make the neuron to have a serious advantage over the transistor. The MEM transistor is actually designed in such a way that it behaves and operates like the neuron. This way, it should be able to perform functions that the neuron can perform in a similar low power consumption and at a similar speed. So what is the MEM transistor? That is what we should be discussing under the slide, structure of the MEM transistor. The term MEM transistor was coined or formed from two words memristor and transistor, meaning that the mem transistor actually has the ability to perform the function of a memristor and also a transistor. So we shall be discussing what memristors are. What are memristors? Memristors, which is a short or an abbreviation of memory resistors, are resistors that remember the voltage previously applied to them, meaning that memristors have the property of memory or storage. So how does the mem how does the mem resistor do this? We shall be explaining the, this through the image at the left hand side of this slide. From this image, we notice that a mem resistor actually has two terminals. Please take note that this is not how a resistor look like on a real life scenario. But just to make things easier for us to understand, we imagine the mem resistor as a pipe. Now, when higher current flow through it, the mem resistor reduces its resistance so that more current can flow through it. Now, when the current reduces, the mem resistor increases its resistance. What, what happens when the current flows in the reverse direction? When it flows in the reverse direction, the mem resistor increases its resistance. The good thing about mem resistor is that even after the current has stopped flowing, the former value of the resistance remains the same. This way, the mem resistor is able to remember the amount of current that flowed through. This ability makes it possible for the mem resistor to behave like a storage device. Mem resistor So speaking in summary, we notice that mem resistors can therefore perform two functions. One, they can be used as a memory device. Two, they can also perform computations depending on how the mem resistors are connected. These two functions make the mem resistor to compute like a human brain because we discussed that the neuron can both perform the function of a memory that is storage and also perform computations. These properties make the mem resistor similar to the human brain, at least in that aspect. However, there is a major drawback. The mem resistor is a two-terminal device, meaning that it cannot behave like a transistor. Notice that a neuron has 10,000 connections. 
So it will make no sense if a memory resistor that just have two terminals will be similar to the neuron. So to make sure that the memory resistor is now a multi-terminal, we now form the mem transistor. So a mem transistor is formed by converting the mem resistor to a multi-terminal device. So this makes it possible for a mem resistor to have more than two terminals. The material used to develop a mem transistor from a mem resistor is known as molybdenum disulfide. So instead of using silicon that we have used in developing our conventional transistor, we replace silicon with molybdenum disulfide. Why do we replace silicon with molybdenum disulfide? Molybdenum disulfide has some particularly interesting properties. One of those properties is that the material has well-defined grain boundaries. But what are grain boundaries and why are they particularly important? Well, molybdenum disulfide is crystalline in nature, so meaning that it has well-defined pattern. The boundary between one pattern and the next is known as grain boundary. Molybdenum disulfide grain boundary is well-defined, meaning that it is orderly in nature. Now, why is this very important? Well, if a material's grain boundary is not well-defined, it simply means the electrical properties will not be well-defined. So things like resistance and how the material responds to electric fields will cannot be predicted. So since molybdenum disulfide's grain boundary is well-defined, it means that its resistance and other electrical properties can be predicted so that we can perfectly design a transistor. Another advantage of the MEM transistor of molybdenum disulfide, I beg your pardon, is that it is atomically thin, meaning that it can be easily influenced by electric field. Since the material is atomically thin, we assume that its height is zero, meaning that it can easily be influenced by any electric field it comes in contact with. And that is one uh, good property of transistor, and that is why the MOSFET have particularly gained um, popularity today due to the fact it can easily be influenced by electric field. Also, the uh, molybdenum disulfide also have the properties of mem resistors. Consequently, it exhibits both the behavior of a memory and also a switch, meaning that a mem transistor fabricated from molybdenum disulfide can store data and also can perform operations that a transistor can perform. That is very cool. So now that we have spoken about the structure of the MEM transistor, let us talk about how the MEM transistor is fabricated. For us to fabricate the MEM transistor, we grow silicon oxide on a silicon substrate. Then after growing silicon oxide, we we'll therefore grow molybdenum disulfide on top of the silicon oxide using chemical vapor deposition. We spoke about chemical vapor deposition in class. Chemical vapor deposition is when we react two or more gases to form the desired material. So we react two or more materials to form a monolayer of uniform polycrystalline molybdenum disulfide on the silicon oxide. Now, after this is done, we now characterize the material using three processes. But what is characterization? Characterization simply means after we have manufactured our material, we perform some analysis to see whether the material has the desired properties or characteristics that we want. So there are three processes that we do to make sure to detect whether we have properly manufactured the MEM transistor. The first is X-ray photoelectron, the second is photoluminescence, and the third is Raman spectroscopies. Both the three of them has their pros and cons, so an engineer would decide which of those theory he will use in characterizing the MEM transistor. After the MEM transistor has been characterized, we come to measure and find out that the channel length and width is varies from 5 microns to 150 microns. This is relatively large compared to conventional transistors that have channel length in nanometers. 
So for us to visualize things, here are three diagrams. The first diagram talks about an optical micrograph of CVD grown polycrystalline monolayer of molybdenum disulfide. If we look at this diagram carefully, we notice that some areas are darker than the others. The areas that are darker than the others are defects that came about in the manufacturing process. The second picture shows the schematic of the molybdenum disulfide MEM transistor. From this second picture, we notice that silicon is the last material at the bottom, followed by silicon oxide, then followed by the polycrystalline CVD molybdenum disulfide. And we notice the drain and the source of the MEM transistor. While the third picture shows the optical micrograph of a MEM transistor chip. So, those chip has a lot of MEM transistors on it. The distance between each of the yellow boxes is the channel length. So, what are the achievements of the MEM transistor? The MEM transistor makes it possible for a transistor to have multiple terminals. Current fabrication techniques allow for up to seven terminals. This is more than times two of the conventional transistor, which have just three terminals. And so, this allows for multiple connection to other MEM transistor. A MEM transistor also makes it possible for a single device to perform both storage and computation, since the MEM transistor also have MEM resistor properties. So these two points that we have just mentioned makes a MEM transistor similar to a neuron, since a neuron can perform both storage and computation operation. Full utilization of MEM transistor will therefore make chip have a higher processing speed with ultra low power consumption, just like the neuron. One thing we know for sure is that the device cannot be 100% perfect. So what are the limitations of the MEM transistor? Well, we said earlier that the MEM transistor has up to 7 terminals. This is very low compared to neurons that can have up to 10,000 connections. Meaning that the MEM transistor is still very very far in trying to imitate the neurons. Another limitation of the MEM transistor is that it's still relatively large compared to conventional transistors. Conventional transistors have diameters or dimensions in nanometers and that is why chips of nowadays are very small and contain billions of transistors. But compared to the MEM transistor, the dimensions of the MEM transistor is still a microns, which is relatively large compared to modern transistors. The speed of the MEM transistor is still very slow compared to the neurons. So there is need to increase the speed of MEM transistors to mimic the neurons. Lastly, current fabrication techniques also limit the number of MEM transistors that can be on a chip. For us to actually realize a chip that functions like a human, we will need billions of MEM transistors to be on the chip. But current fabrication techniques only limit this to a few hundreds. And that actually makes sense because current fabrication techniques we are designed for three terminal devices. So using that same fabrication techniques for seven terminal device or more terminal device will actually have severe limitations. So in conclusion, we find out that brain like computing makes it possible for us to have low power, high speed and smaller devices. MEM transistor makes it possible for us to mimic how the brain carries out its operation by means of multi terminals. That is to say, just like neurons having multi terminals, it is good that we have transistor that have multi terminals and MEM transistor achieves that purpose. We also need a single device that performs both storage and computation operations just like the neurons. And lastly, future advancement will need to make the MEM transistor smaller faster and also to have more terminals. In conclusion, I will quote Mark Hessam who spearheads the project of fabricating MEM transistor. He said that we believe that the MEM transistor can be a foundational circuit element for new forms of 
neuromorphic computing. So here are a list of articles that I checked upon when preparing this slide. Thanks for watching.